lectures together. And this is PowerPoint, so it's very hard to change equations. So again, usually I was using Beamer, but now I use some PowerPoints and it's very hard to modify. Uh, sometimes let's say we can take some, uh, let's say systems, let's say this is like collaboration with some uh, faculty from our university. And in this case, we have, let's say, atoms, maybe oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, and so on. And we know some coordinates, let's say X, Y, and Z. And the task can be, given this input, I want to predict some property, so let's say potential energy and so on. And maybe sometimes I can just take the pictures, maybe in this case, I got a stop sign, which in, in this case, this is my input. I want to make prediction, I want to classify what kind of object is on this picture. You can see that uh, this data is coming from, from some distribution. And we don't really know the distribution. It's very hard to know the whole distribution because this can include pictures which you already saw, which you will see in the future, and so on. So usually we don't know the distribution for sure. And let's say what we can do in machine learning, we can somehow try to choose some parameters, let's say W. Sometimes I will call this on X later in the later slides. So this, those are my weights. And maybe what I can do, I can choose some prediction function, let's say linear prediction, which will be just summing uh, the xi's with wi's and so on. So basically computing this, computing this dot product between the input and the weights. So this basically is like the simplest linear model which you can do. And afterwards, what I want to do, I want to find this good weight. Good, this, this, uh, I want to choose this w such that if I get some new instance, it's a new email or a new picture, I will somehow compute this uh, prediction. And this should be very close to my yi, okay? So again, my, my task would be, I want to find this w such that if I get some new instance, I will get the correct label, a correct output. I need to also choose some function, some loss function, which is going to measure how close my prediction is going to be to the true label. For example, I can just take this square norm, which is like the, maybe the simplest example of the loss function but there are also some, some much more fancy which people are using. So again, in the training phase, basically what I want to do, I want to just find this W such that the loss or basically the disagreement between my prediction and the true label will be minimized. So basically I just want to choose this W such that if I get some instance XI, my prediction will be close to my true label. Of course, this is very hard because XI and YI are from some distribution. So maybe I can say, I want to choose W, which will minimize the expected loss, okay? Again, it's very hard because we don't know the distribution. So usually what we can do, we can sample uh, many points, let's say millions or 10 millions and so on. So N is usually very large. And afterwards, I can somehow approximate this expectation just by the average. So basically my task could be, I want to find W, which will minimize my basically estimate of, of the expectation, okay? So again, what's very important is that this N can be very, very large. And basically, for some problems, this problem which we want to optimize, this FW, capital FW, is written as average of many, many functions, okay? So again, usually what we have, D, which is the dimension of the say, inputs, or basically the number of weights which we have, usually this is very large. Also N, which is how many data points we have, is also usually very, very large. And also this F can be non-convex. And for example, one very famous model is not linear models, but those deep neural network. In this case, our W, or basically our weights, are those matrices which somehow maps this input into this input. So basically in this case, if I have, let's say, three different inputs or three different features, I will multiply this one by matrix, which is three by three. I will get, again, three different, uh, let's say, outputs, I can apply some nonlinear functions on top of that for every basically neuron here. I will multiply by additional matrix, which is like three by two, which somehow maps those three different features into two different features. And suddenly I get some output from my neural network. And because uh, those weights and those activation functions actually can be nonlinear in this case, my function will be nonlinear, okay? Or usually even non-convex. Non so basically, my task would be really trying to choose those weights in this neural network such that I will somehow minimize this non-convex function uh, which I have here. 
because now see I switched maybe uh, the weights from W to X now. Okay, so if you try to try to Google like how easy it is to train, usually people say, oh, it's super, it's super easy. You just use some HDD algorithm, and afterwards you will train it. it it's not big big deal. Okay, but it's not really all always true. For many problems, which are the textbook problem, really using HDD is easy. But for some problems, this is super hard. And I want to explain why and when this will be hard. Before that, I want to mention this HDD and how it works. So basically, we have a function fx, where x is basically the dimensional vector. Let's say those are my weights. I want to minimize this one. In HGD, you just choose one function at a time, input gradient only for one function, and then I somehow update my weights. Okay? And by the way, this uh, guy was at the Lehigh, and Lehigh doesn't pay me to mention it, but they say it's very nice to mention. So, so again, the update is super simple. You st somehow start to iterate over this, uh, say, from k. k is 0 at the beginning. I somehow choose some x0 randomly. Afterwards, I will choose the function i randomly, choose some step size hk, and afterwards, I will update. By choosing this one randomly and uniformly, really make sure that on average, my expectation of this of this stochastic gradient is going to be equal to, to the full gradient. So again, it's almost like running the steepest descent, but computing this stochastic gradient is much cheaper. So it's almost like n times cheaper than computing the full gradient. So again, this is usually much faster. So if you want to put on the x-axis the time, how long does it take to get some accuracy? For HDD, you can see I decrease the, the error very quickly. For gradient descent, is super, super slow because every iteration is super expensive. You are far away, roughly speaking, almost every I will give you the same direction. So again, using gradient descent will be just, just a pain. Uh, there's also like some small modification of Adam, which someone tries to use some different scaling for different coordinates. And this paper had already like 26,000 26, citations last year. And just moving one year later, it's already 55. So basically, this is really the state of the art uh, algorithm for training deep learning models and so on. Again, it's almost like HDD, but they're using some kind of momentum. So basically, this gradient here would be replaced by some almost like moving average of the last few gradients. And also there will be some preconditioning or some somehow like diagonal preconditioning, which somehow tells you that for different different features of different coordinates of the gradient or the weights, I will have different uh, basically learning rates almost. Okay, so let's do some simple problem and let's just somehow try to motivate why Adam could not be the best for all those problems which we have in deep learning. So think about this very simple two example. I got 100 points, 50 red and 50 purple. I got two different classes. I would just design some neural network with, uh, which has like 847 parameters. So again, I got two different inputs, which is X and Y. I will put then 10 different hidden layers, 10 hidden layers, 30 hidden layers, 10 hidden, la hidden neurons, sorry, and five and two for the output. I will usually, for classification, I can use this salt mass cross entropy loss function, which is basically a little bit more, more, more fancy and really works much better for classification problems. And afterwards, I want to just see how well I can train this one with Adam. So the question would be, I really want to do a very good initialization as it is done usually for deep learning. I will use Adam and I will run it for long enough. And the question would be, is it easy or hard for him to solve this like classification problem? I really want to find some maybe some separation between those two classes using Adam and this deep neural network. You can see it's not really over over parameter over so much because there are only like 900 parameters. But still, I got only 100 points, which is nothing. It turns out if I'm in the in person, I would ask you to vote, but it's very hard to vote. So usually people say, yes, it should be easy. It turns out for this Adam, it's easy. And he can also do it like very, with very good margin, but for the algorithm Adam, it's actually very, very hard. 
So basically, in this case, what I've been showing you is that I will run Adam for 1,000 epochs with bet size of 1 or bet size of 10 for 3,000 epochs. Again, one epoch means that I will touch every sample roughly once, which really means if I use bet size of 1, I got 100 different data points. This really means that one epoch is 100 iterations. In this case, one epoch is uh, 10 iterations because I always choose 10 functions to some estimate the gradient. And what, can we, what we can see here is that uh, most likely the accuracy which you will get will be less than 95. So again, accuracy really means that how many points I classify correctly. If I really classify all of them, I, if I basically if I can sound train this DNN to predict for every single training data point uh, the correct label, I will have accuracy of 100. But you can see I'm most likely getting around 93. I'm getting also quite often 25, 20, 26, and only I think that once this uh, Adam managed to train this DNN to get accuracy of 100%. If I somehow use this larger bit size, maybe it should be somewhat much more stable. You can see that roughly the same, same answer. Almost like most, much more likely, you will not be able to achieve more than 95% accuracy if you somehow train this one with Adam. And one reason why is this happening is because your DNN is very small and uh, it's not really large. If you somehow try to put epochs on the x axis, in this case, this was this like bet size of 10. You can see that uh, if I somehow try to plot the number of gradient on the y-axis, it goes down. Suddenly, this one will jump up. Again, it goes down. Again, it, will somehow try to, it somehow tries to jump up and so on and so on. So what we are experiencing here is some set of points. If you think about uh, the gradient algorithm, close to set of point, the gradient will become smaller, smaller, and smaller. Once you escape the set of point, the gradient will somehow increase. Again, you will somehow go, you converge, converge, converge to some neighborhood of some set of point. Again, you will somehow escape set of point and so on. So basically, we can see that the problem is non-convex, which we already knew, but also this non-convexity can cause some troubles. And also, you can somehow see here the accuracy here. In this case, I'm showing you accuracy and also the size of the gradient. And you can see I was going to some set of point. Of course, I'm just doing some small updates because my size of gradient is tiny. I'm somehow keeping the same accuracy. Afterwards, I will escape the set of point. I improve my prediction. I improve my accuracy. Again, I will somehow jump down to some set of point. I'll be stuck. Afterwards, I will somehow escape the set of point. I will go to some new set of point and so on. I also like this plot here. So in this case, it shows you that after I trained, let's say, Adam for this uh, 1,000 or 3,000 epochs, this is how I make predictions, OK? So basically, for every single git point on this 2D plot, I somehow try to compute what is going to be the prediction from the model. And now let's say you think about how the HDD works or how the Adam works. You choose only a few points. And now you say, I want to modify the weights in such a way that I will imp improve my classification function or my prediction function for only those points in my gradient, right? But if I somehow choose this point and this point and this point, maybe I will improve it for this point, but maybe I completely screw up for those points here. In the next iterations, I will choose those points. Again, I want to improve it here. Maybe I completely ignore those points and so on and so on. So again, it's very hard for those HDD algorithms to really solve some kind of problems which are very sensitive on the input and on the, on the parameters. OK, we also did some different experiment. In this case, I'm running this gradient distance algorithm. You can see I'm just really compute the full gradient. I will do some line search to really make a good step. And this is my functional value. Now, there's this nice paper which somehow says that most of the problems in deep learning and so on looks almost like convex. What I mean is that if your function is convex, then definitely this will be positive, right? Basically, if you want to take the difference of some points and difference of gradients, for convex problem, this has to be positive, right? Which really means if you are trying to optimize this DNN, almost 
almost basically always, if you just run this gradient descent, you don't even realize this objective function is non-convex. This, this dot product will be always positive. We can see it here. As I run it, I get different xk's. For every xk, I compute the function value, compute the gradient for xk and k plus one, compute the difference of the gradients, make the code have a difference of the points, it will be always positive. But because our DNN was somehow smaller, I could really compute the full Hessian. So in this case, what you can see, I have almost like 900 dimension. I computed the full Hessian, and so I'm showing you the eigenvalues of the Hessian. The blue one are positive, the red one are negative. And you can now see there's like few, maybe one or two very large eigenvalues, and the rest are roughly the same for positive or negative in this point. If I go here, it was roughly the same story. If I go here, it's roughly the same story. So basically, even though if you run your gradient distance algorithm, you don't even realize this is non convex problem, but almost everywhere, the Hessian, the spectrum was telling you this is non convex. And maybe we can somehow use this negative curvature efficiently, or somehow the, the, the knowledge that this is non convex problem, maybe I can really just uh, solve this one much faster. Okay, so why it actually doesn't work well for some problems? Now think about what is uh, deep learning. You have some model, some new network, you get some input, you compute prediction, right? Now this is a function of the inputs and the weights. So those are the weights you should have someone to optimize. Now, because this is a function, I know I can compute the Lipschitz constant of this function, okay? And roughly speaking, the Lipschitz constant of this function will be nothing else, just product of the spectral norms of the matrices you're using to go from one layer to second and so on and so on, and also multiply by some Lipschitz constant of some activation functions. Now, you think about this one. If I have some classification problem, let's say I got some pictures of dogs and maybe cats, Usually the pictures for the dogs to, or like that's not clustered, right? Which really means if I have two different inputs, in this case, this picture and this picture, which are close to each other, then also the label will be close to each other, okay? So maybe if I, let's say, use the output to be, let's say, one and zero if this is dog, or zero, one if this is cat, if I have two different instances, two different A's, which are close to each other, then clearly the output should be the same. Which really means that for those easy problems, maybe my Lipschitz constant can be small, right? And when you want to use Adam algorithm or HGD algorithm for problems which you expect that the Lipschitz constant will be small for this final model, this will be easy to train. On the other hand, there are some problems which are much harder. Think about this one. I will give you some system of atoms. Maybe there will be like hydrogen and maybe hydrogen, or maybe hydrogen and something else. And I can sometimes to compute the distance between them. So let's say my input will be, I got two atoms, and the distance between them is going to be, let's say, R. For different distances, I will have different energy, the potential energy. With the distance in infinity, the energy will be equal to zero. With the distance, it will be somehow optimal, I will have a very stable system and my energy will be very tiny. If I somehow put them closer to, closer to each other, uh, the system will be very unstable and therefore the energy will be huge. Okay? So basically now we can see that I can have instances which are very close to each other, but the outputs will, the outputs will be very different from each other, which really means that my Lipschitz constant should be huge, right? If my Lipschitz constant is large, if I sound go back, this really means that some spectral norms of these Ws will be also large, right? If some Ws will have a large spectral norm, this really means that a small change to this W will completely make the predictions for different instances to be very different, right? It really means if I make some small change to this W, maybe my outputs for all those points that someone already learned and trained will be completely different, okay? Actually, this was the case how we built the example where Adam failed, which was uh, which was this one. Because basically the functions was changing 
pretty quickly. It was, I think, that uh, sine of a times x plus minus something. It really means this was very hard. We really want to have some instances which are close to each other and have a different label. So basically, this really forces us to have very large L, which really means I need to have large spectral norms of some some weights in the in the DNN. And my computer is somehow freezing. So now let's let's compare how this one, like how Adam compares with steepest descent, which is the gradient descent in this case, with classical BFGS, LBFGS, SI1, and so on, and also Newton, Newton class region. We can somehow see that the Adam is somehow stuck here. We only that's say 10 times from different starting points. This is some showing you number of iterations, but really for Adam, this was a uh, number of epochs, otherwise number of iterations. You can somehow see that gradient descent needs somehow like 500 iterations to get this solution. But in every iteration, someone need, we need to compute the gradient. We need to compute some, you know, like line search, some adjust the step size which really means that every iteration is much more expensive than one epoch. But you can also see that if I use this Truss region uh, algorithm, I just want solving this, this subproblem exactly, or maybe using CG, I just need only like 50 iterations to solve it perfectly. After 50 iterations, I find the weights for my DNN model, which works perfectly, right? Again, every CG, uh, every iteration of Newton class region CG needs multiple epochs. I need to compute Hessian vector products for many different vectors, right? Which really means that this needs almost like five different epochs per one iteration of CG. But still, we can see those fancy algorithms like second order algorithms are pretty cool. They can solve those, uh, they can somehow train these uh, tiny neural networks with, like, quite quickly, okay? So again, second order methods are somehow good, but clearly I could maybe solve this one easily. And also this like this problem was super small. Like my DNN was only just few, maybe like thousand weights, even less than thousand. But maybe I can somehow try to do it on cheaper, like trying to use still a Newton class region, but not really using CG because every CG step will need to multiply Hessian tens vector. Okay. And also, after even you compute that one, you still need to have these ratios and see how your model improved and so on, which really consume like a lot of resources because you need to compute Hessian tens vector, like sequentially. So we thought about let's what's about using BFGS to estimate the Hessian. Okay, so I'll build some Hessian approximation using BFGS and then use Truss region with the estimate of BFGS. So again. This is maybe this some of us good idea at the beginning when we thought about it, but once we somehow try to run some algorithms, we find out this is not going to work. The reason is actually here. Think about if my Hessian has spectrum like this. There's maybe like one or two large uh, large eigenvalues, which are maybe like ten or hundred times larger than the rest. If I somehow want to uh, use this uh, S and Y pairs, let's say S will be the difference of weights and Y will be the difference of gradients, we can somehow see that if I plug it inside, the S transpose Y will be almost always positive. And let's say even let's say if I define Y to be Hessian times S. Again, I will have this Hessian with this spectrum. If I define Y to be Hessian times S, so basically there's no like gradient differences, then Actually, most likely, y transpose s will be always positive. So we have some some theorem which, which tells you that if you have such an example like this, maybe the chance of s transpose y will be negative will be almost like 10 to minus 7. Okay? So again, if some say I will just choose a few s's randomly from some unit ball, if I define y to be Hessian times s, this, then most likely S transpose Y will be positive, which really means that if I start with B0, which is positive definite, this really means that my BK will be positive definite, which really means that even let's say if I want to use this BK in self trust region, it cannot really capture any negative curvature, right? Which really means this is not going to work. So therefore, this is what about SR1? 
Basically, in SR1 update, what we have is that even if S transpose Y will be always positive, you really are using some, some almost like subtracting the effect of uh, some of them, with some of the pairs which you already have. So basically, we saw a spectrum like this. Maybe there's like some huge positive eigenvalue and eigenvector correspond to this eigenvalue. You somehow try to subtract this one for the next pairs, which really means that maybe using SR1, we can really capture maybe those large uh, eigenvalues in the magnitude. And afterwards, maybe our approximation will be not positive definite, and therefore we can maybe use stress region using this approximation. Okay. Basically, again, this one allows you to build this BK, which will not be positive definite, even if all of those pairs which you had have been having dot product which is bigger than zero. Okay, so basically what happens if we try to compare what we are getting? We already knew that BFGS or LBFGS is not going to be positive, and it will be always positive definite with high probability. So we somehow ran this uh, steepest descent. This was for a very tiny DNN, only 36 uh, basically features. We had or 36 uh, parameters we had only had. We ran it, we chose a few different points, as at this point, this point, and this point. For all of those, we somehow computed uh, the full spectrum, okay, for the full Hessian. You can see the those blue ones and those, I don't know what's the color here, are the negative and positive eigenvalues. The red one is using a sample SR1. Basically, what does it mean? I will, in every iteration, I will just randomly choose, maybe in this case, 16, I don't know how much, uh, pairs of 16 points from the unit ball. I will define Y to be Hessian times S. And basically, in this case, I got uh, 16 different uh, SY pairs. And then I will somehow use this SR1 to build a Hessian approximation. You can now see that it's really capturing those eigenvalues with the largest magnitude almost perfectly. You can now compare with uh, SR1 or limited memory SR1. Actually, at the beginning, I think these are just 10 points. They are, they are the same because, again, you have the same memory for SR1 and also limited memory SR1. We saw run, run, run small longer. SR1 is using all those pairs which you observed, which really means this would be completely biased. And you can see it's not really capturing the, the spectrum perfectly. Even SR1 or limited memory SR1 is not really perfect. But I was sampled SR1, which really means every iteration, I will multiply Hessian with few S's, we just now choose uniformly from some in the ball. I will define Y to be Hessian times S. In this case, I will be getting Hessian approximation, which is somehow good, right? Again, this is roughly the same picture, but this is for a much larger DNN. In this case, we have like 176 uh, parameters to tune. It's the same story you can see. We are really capturing the eigenvalues, which are large in magnitude, positive and negative, very well. Not only eigenvalues, but also eigenvectors. There are like uh, small differences between the subspace you some discover, either using the full Hessian or using the SR1, the sample SR1, okay? So afterwards, basically, this is our algorithm. You going to iterate. You will always choose a few S's from some unit ball. You will define Y to be Hessian times S. Again, you can sound do this one efficiently using basically automatic differentiation. And afterwards, I can build this BK using SR1 approximation. And afterwards, I can solve this trust region subproblem. Remember, once I build the SR1 approximation, I can actually solve this one efficiently. I don't need to touch any data set. I just have my S and Y. That's all what I need and also gradient to solve this subproblem. And then after I solve this one, I get some PK, which is basically my direction. And then I just run classical trust region. I see how the decrease of the model is compared to the decrease of the function value of the whole, basically, my DNN model. And afterwards, I can either accept the, accept the step or I can reject the step. And at the end, I can somehow try to adjust my radius. Again, this is my transition radius. Again, this is a super simple algorithm. 
let's see how it works. Okay, before before that, we also have some convergence theorems. Actually, we have many of them. This is just one of them showing you that even let's say when you have non-convex uh, problem, still in the limit, the number of the gradient will be equal to zero. So again, and this assumption is just telling you, I got C2 differentiable functions. I will only use few pairs, such as this is true when I somehow build this uh, SR1 approximation. This just tells you that the function will be if it's continuous. This one tells you that I should have sufficient, uh, sufficiently solve the subproblem, the transition subproblem in every iteration and so on. Okay, so let's see how does this compare on our simple problem where somehow Adam is failing. So there are a few plots here. Let's start with the, the bottom row. Again, in this case, we are showing you number of epochs on the x-axis. The Adam is here. Again, we are running this one many times. And this one shows you the confusion, basically. Like we had many runs, let's say, which were in this, in this, in this cloud, or the, let's say the uh, LBFJs and so on. Adam will be very quick at the beginning, and then we stack around 88%. The same here, when you have much larger DNN. And actually, again, the same is roughly here. Maybe this is much better because I got much larger DNN model, but still, it's somehow slow. So let's go back here. Uh, on the top row, I'm showing you box plots. So this tells you that if I give you a budget of 20 uh, epochs, where will be the solution given by Adam and gradient descent and SI1 and so on and BFGS and all those different algorithms we compare? Again, I got gradient descent, I got Adam, I got a BFGS, limited memory of BFGS, SI1, limited memory of SI1, and this I was sampled SI1. So again, in this case, every iteration, I choose few vectors from some unit ball, let's say, randomly. I will define y to be Hessian times s. You can see that at the beginning, if I give you just 20 epochs, we are roughly the same. If I give you a budget of uh, 100 epochs, we are much better than Adam and also much better than other algorithms. Now, after 200 epochs, you can see that uh, I think that uh, where we are, we are somewhere here. Like the sample SI1 solved almost all problems except maybe two different instances and, uh, and so on and so on. So basically this really tells you that using this uh, second order information, trying to discover some uh, positive and negative curvature, trying to very cheaply uh, solve this trust region without really touching the data set is really beneficial. When we somehow have like much larger network again, we are beating all those other, other algorithms. Still, this is only some two examples. So again, we knew that for this data set, Adam will suffer. Again, if you some, just take some classical images and let's say MNIS like digits from zero to nine, I don't think we'll beat Adam because again, this is like usually very easy problem. May, may I clarify a small question? Yes, so, no when you show the, when you show the accuracy, is that training accuracy or test of a test? Uh, actually, actually, this was like super simple problem. So in this case, it's the same. So I have only okay. one data set which I pretend is like training and also testing. Okay. Uh, I don't know what it was. Yeah, that simple sinusoid which we had. Okay. So yeah, actually, we don't really care about now about training and testing. We really just want to see, like, you know, like we understood why Adam should be suffering. And also, this really shows us that yes, if you expect your Lipschitz constant to be large in some sense, mm -hmm. uh, then Adam will suffer. Of course, you could do something else. You could somehow build some new features or some transformation of the features to really make sure that uh, that your Lipschitz constant can be small, and then Adam will maybe probably be much better, right? Actually, the, the whole motivation why we care about these small models because we can say, hey, why don't you just choose this large model or maybe even larger, right? Is that I work with some guys from material science. I don't understand exactly what they want to do, but they say that in, uh, let's say, CERN, this large hydrogen collider, they're producing this data so quickly that the device which they want to run these small machine learning models has to have in, in, uh, inference less than nanoseconds, which really means that you cannot even train a large model, right? It's impossible because 
the deeper the model you have, the longer it takes to make the inference, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, the larger Ws you have, the larger matrices inside, this really means that it will take you much longer to make inference. So mm -hmm. we somehow, I try to somehow now think, hey, can I just take the MNIST data set and just use maybe, I don't know, like uh, 100 weights or 200 weights? Can I classify it correctly? Or can I somehow get this, uh, this uh, like model which will give me high accuracy using only a few parameters? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was some nice paper where they showed that if you train the MNIST algorithm or MNIST data set, which is basically from zero to nine digits to recognize, if you somehow start feeding like with 50% chance wrong label, if you're having these huge, huge deep neural networks, then you will confuse them. But let's say when you're even somehow like flipping labels randomly with probability 55 or so 50 or 75% even, the accuracy for small networks will be still high, maybe like 90%. Mm -hmm. So there's a claim that if you have this small network, it has to really learn something important from the inputs. When you're having these huge networks, you somehow just need to memorize something. Yeah. So basically, therefore, like we somehow really just want to see, can we train some small networks? And also, usually small networks, you can also interpret that one, or basically you can somehow have much, maybe much more resistant to noise and so on. So again, in this case, we didn't really care about uh, testing and training, uh, trade-offs and so on. We just really wanted to see, like, what is the bottleneck? Can I use some heavy machinery, like second order, al second al second order algorithms to train super tiny network? And how does it compare with Adam? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Again, for, for huge networks, like Adam is going to win. I'm pretty sure about that. But the, the reason I ask is because there is another subtlety, right? So it's the generalization, right? So if you try even the training, for the training, it looks pretty good, but it's, it may target to a different uh, local minimizer of the, of, the, of the landscape. So then generalization, it, it, it's hard to say it will suffer or not suffer. So that's the reason I'm just curious. Yeah, actually, it's a very good question. I don't have the slides here, but uh, it turns out at this for our experiments is that you should first run some kind of Adam. And once Adam starts to be somehow stuck, you can switch to second ah. order method. And once you escape, you can again switch to Adam. I see. So, so, so which means the first order approach, that attraction based on or that local minimizer region is still very important. Then, but then use the second order to speed up. You're still sitting in that region. Yes, yes, yes. So basically, again, like when I somehow try to train this algorithm just only using second order, second order method, and again, if you somehow don't put any regularization, again, you just feed the training data to be training data, training data to be small, right? Uh -huh. As you said, doesn't really tell you anything about testing data set. Uh -huh. But still, you can somehow try to put there some regularization to somehow make sure that if you some pair the data, it will be still the same labels and so on. But again, in this case, I just want to see, can I train a small DNN efficiently? I got you. Thank you so much. If you're thinking about here, if I, we have some show you this, this plot here, basically what's happening. Uh, I think it's this one, right? Again, if you somehow, See here that you know I don't really do anything. My garden's tiny. Maybe I just can use this uh, algorithm for maybe two iterations, and maybe I will somehow jump somewhere else. Maybe I can really just jump this one over this much quicker. I can mm -hmm. escape the setup point very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. You really want to escape the setup point, and then again you will do some progress even with some simple algorithms like Adam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really the whole story. You you. Ideally, you want to combine both of them together. Mm -hmm. so again, at the beginning, think about it, at the beginning, it doesn't make sense to use some heavy like second order algorithms when even gradient will do a huge, huge uh, improvement. Mm -hmm. Thanks. A very good question. Thank you. So let's go here. OK, so again, this is like theory. Actually, there's, there's much more theorems in the paper. And this actually we cover this one. So now let's speak about Sonia. If I didn't say something here, the BK, what we are using here and also on those different uh, plots I was showing you, is using B0 to be 0 okay? 
Because usually what you are doing, you are choosing a busy or to say identity or some constant times identity and so oh. on. And basically what they are doing is you're just shifting the whole spectrum up and down. So what we decided was to choose B0 to B0, which really means that my BK was really just a, like not even full rank. It was just really just a low rank matrix. Let's say when I choose M pairs, there was just maybe M non-zero eigenvalues for this BK. Which really means this was not really optimal maybe to do. So of course, we designed this Sonia algorithm. Actually, it's a very good story by Sonia because one of my PhD students, his daughter was uh, Sarah. So we wrote a paper about Sarah algorithm. And then my daughter was born, which is like called Sonia. Her name is Sonia. And my wife was pushing me, hey, when you will write, when you will write some algorithm, Sonia. So we already have it here. So what happens with Sonia is that you either can use some first order methods like uh, HGD, SVRG, some memory variance uh, var detection algorithms of HGD and so on. Or you can maybe run some, let's say, LBFGS, SR1 and so on. Usually for these uh, first order methods, usually it's super fast to implement, very easy, but usually there's no really possibility for some parallelism. What I like about second order methods is that if you want to run them in parallel or distributed, it, it's super efficient because you have so much compute to do, and then you just do only a few iterations to converge. So usually, if you want to write some distributed algorithms, then second order are much easier to scale. Okay. And also, usually, what you are doing or what you're suffering with uh, first order methods are that you need to, need to tune the, le the learning rate, you need to tune everything. Where for some second order algorithms, it's uh, less tuning. You just take it and you somehow use the line search, you use this one, this one, this one. It somehow works perfectly. In Sonia, it's some kind of mixture between the first order and second order algorithms, which we described. So basically, how does it work with Sonia is that I want to quickly decompose the gradient into two different subspaces. For one, I will make just the gradient step. For second one, I will use some kind of Newton step, okay, almost like Newton step. But it's not really Newton. There's this nice paper from Alejandro Ribeiro and co-authors, which some designed some algorithm which you can somehow call like almost a like non-convex Newton method, okay? We understand that if you have let's say non-convex function, you just take this Newton step, let's say for this function, doesn't matter where you start, this will be equal to zero. So basically, in the one step of the Newton method, if you can really just compute the inverse of the Hessian, we'll be, equal, we will, we'll be taking you to this set of point. So therefore, what you need to do is you need to modify the Hessian, let's say almost like taking the absolute value of the Hessian. Really, what I mean is you compute, compute SV uh, eigenvalue decomposition, then you somehow get this U uh, sigma and, or U, and U lambda and U transpose, you take the absolute value of this of this lambda. So basically, in this, in this paper, they describe this algorithm where you compute the Hessian, you store it, you compute eigenvalue decomposition, V lambda, V transpose. Afterwards, you take this, uh, this, these eigenvalues, you make absolute value of this, and basically, suddenly, this will be positive definite. And you can also some try, someone try to truncate the small eigenvalues, let's say, which, which are less than, let's say, epsilon, and just set this to epsilon, and then you some take, the, the, take the inverse of this one. So basically, the algorithm is super simple. You compute the gradient. I compute this eigenvalue decomposition, take the absolute value here, some truncate with some omega in this case. So everything which is more than omega, I will set to omega. Then I still compute the inverse of this one. Again, I will build this approximation, and then I will multiply by the gradient. So actually, this really makes sense because if you start anywhere, if I start here, I will, I will not really go to set a point. I will go away from the set a point. Okay? So again, this algorithm really makes sense. You can prove convergence and so on. But the expensive part was that you need to somehow compute this one. So I need to run some expensive, expensive algorithms to build some decomposition of this uh, Hessian and so on. 
So what did someone thought about, hey, maybe let's use this sampling again. It's almost like sketching. I will take the Hessian, multiply by some uh, random matrix S. Again, S will be a few points from some unit ball. I will define the Y to be Hessian times S. And afterwards, I can have this BK, which will be my Hessian approximation. Again, this BK is, is basically almost like block SR1 update. Again, I will just use this one. Because I'll see if I multiply B by S, I will get, just get Y. Okay? Again, if this is like full ring and so on. Again, I somehow managed to build some sketch or some approximation of the Hessian. And actually, this is my BK here. And after this, what I can do, I can compute this SVD of this matrix. Remember, in this case, this, this will be low rank because my Y, which I will, which I will use, will be like a D rows, which is my dimension, and M will be just memory. So I can, usually the M will be small. So we can now see that if I do it, and if I somehow try to manage to compute this QR of the, of the matrix Y, which will be super cheap, because again, it's like D times M, then I can just really do SVD of this one very easily because I can write Y to be Q times R, Y transpose will be R transpose times Q. So suddenly I will have this uh, matrix here, which will be somehow dense, but it will be M times M, which really means I can compute SVD of this matrix here only, which will be this one. And again, this will be some small orthogonal matrix multiplied by this Q, and basically what I will get, I will get that BK will be nothing else, just VK tilde times lambda K times VK tilde transpose. And now basically we're going to say, this is my Newton, or this is my Hessian approximation in some subspace. I can really just compute the absolute value of this lambda easily and also inverse of this one. Okay. Usually M will be very small, much smaller than D. And the algorithm for Sonia is actually very simple. This V tilde tells us that there's some subspace where you, want, where you have some Hessian approximation of the curvature, right? And also we can have some orthogonal subspace. So again, this is a projection matrix onto some orthogonal subspace of this range of V k tilde. And basically what I will do, I will project my gradient onto those different orthogonal subspaces. So you have this GK transpose, uh, so GK orthogonal and GK, which are orthogonal to each other. Again, GK will be in the range of VK tilde, and GK transpose will be in the orthogonal subspace, okay? So really, I will somehow try to make a step which is using the second order information in one subspace and just gradient descend in the second subspace, okay? So basically, this tells you that I will move also and I will use some partial curvature information, and then in the, in the, in the orthogonal subspace, I would just use the, use the gradient. Okay. And again, we have some proofs. We can show the convergence. We can show that basically the operator which we are doing here, this step basically, is nothing else, just gradient times some operator AK, which is positive definite. The eigenvalues are bounded from below and from above. And basically, afterwards, you have the convergence of this algorithm, super easy to be derived, okay? Again, the algorithm is super simple. You sample a few S's, compute Y to be Hessian times S. Again, you just do it like once. Once you have some samples, you can compute Hessian for those samples times all those different S's which we have. And then, again, this, this is also much better for parallelism and so on. Then I just need to compute some QR decomposition. Again, it is not so expensive because M will be somewhat small. And afterwards, I know how to decompose this gradient to those different subspaces, and then I can compute the update. Just to see how it works. Uh, so basically, I explained this one. There's a theorem which shows you that uh, if you have a deterministic algorithm, which really means you compute functions and gradients exactly, then this will converge linearly to for slowing convex. It will converge slower for non-convex. If you have stochastic algorithms, it against this one somehow works it will, with a fixed step size. But of course, there will be some region how far you can get. If you want to get to better solutions, someone need to diminish step size or someone need to use some variance selection techniques and so on. But let's now see some algorithms for logistic regression and also some nonlinearly squares. 
Again, if you can see, I'm, I'm showing you this epochs here. It's pretty good. So it's even beating this uh, Newton CG. Again, Newton CG is really bad because you still need to uh, compute these uh, Hessian vector products uh, in, a, in a loop, right? There is uh, the CG is iterative algorithm. So you have first estimate, again, you still need to compute second estimate, again, Hessian vector products always and always. So this really makes it, makes, makes it expensive. In another case, I can just choose this S and I can multiply Hessian by this S in one epoch. So therefore, basically, we are much faster in this case. Uh, if I go to uh, non-convex problems, again, it's somehow comparable or actually sometimes even better. If I want to go to some stochastic settings, again, you can see that uh, the Sonia, again, it's much faster if you somehow put these epochs on the x axis. There are some simple data sets only, so again, nothing fancy. And also, you can somehow say, like, do you need to really sample all those S different directions? I can also use some kind of like LBFGS or LSR1 approach where I use the history of the X differences in, in the weights and also differences of gradients. So I'm going to estimate my Hessian approximation. This again, some works. It's somehow faster, but it's faster per iteration, but the convergence is somehow slower. So I think that I'm out of time already. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the nice talk. Any questions? Well, so when you're comparing uh, essentially running time by number, performance by number of epochs, have you also tracked like uh, training on the same machine and seeing what the wall clock time is to get? Because you're doing many more computations for these. Uh, Second order methods per iteration, right? Uh, actually, not really, but yes and no. Okay, yes and no. Uh, this tells the number of effective passes, right? So if I want to do, let's say, Adam with step with the bed size of one, only with bed size of one, then doing one epoch is much more expensive than, let's say, computing gradient or let's say, computing the full gradient. Because again, usually when you think about GPUs, let's say, which is like uh, maybe like 4,000 cores, you want to compute the gradient for only one sample or for two samples or maybe for 50 samples or for 100 samples, it's going to be the same time, okay? Because you have so much computing power on this small GPU that if you really just increase bed size from one, let's say 200 or 2,000, the computation per one, Basically, the computation per this B gradients will be the same. That's the matter of this B. It actually tells me that if I say want to compare the time per one iteration of for, for, sorry for one epoch of gradient descent, this can be say, actually much cheaper than let's say 100 epochs of Adam maybe. Okay, but you are a little bit true about uh, something which is a little bit tricky with Sonia is that currently, at least for deep learning, there is no really function which can compute Hessian times matrix product, okay? So currently for Sonia, for Hessian matrix product, we just need to do it sequentially, which really means it's going to be much slower. But still, it's going to be just one epoch because you bring the data to the machine, and then you really just compute uh, Hessian matrix product sequentially, without really requiring additional data to be brought to the machine. Okay, but again, it's like unfortunate that there is not really a good library for now which allows you to compute Hessian matrix product. But let's say for logistic regression, which I'm going to try to uh, derive it actually, it's, it's written here. When you want to compute Hessian matrix product, actually it will be quite, quite fast. Because first, what do you somehow do? You just multiply this x times s, which x will be the data points. S will be my uh, sketch matrix s. Basically, you multiply this one, then you multiply this one, and then you multiply this. So basically, when you have multi-core machine, we're computing Hessian vector product like for CG. Let's say doing this 100 times will be much more expensive in terms of work of time than computing Hessian times matrix product once. 
I don't know if this makes sense or not. Again, I will sum up it one more time. When I want to compute Hessian times vector, say this will take me, let's say, one second. When I want to compute Hessian times vector 100 times, this will be 100 seconds. But computing Hessian times maybe S, which will be having 100 columns, will be much faster than 100 seconds. OK, thank you. OK, because in this case, you can really use this uh, multiple C multiple cores or GPUs to make it efficiently parallel. More questions? Yeah, yeah I have a question for the sum volume. So in, I think in your first algorithm, you do this random sum volume and somehow you show in, in your picture uh, your method somehow can capture the big eigenvalues. Yes. All right. So I wonder uh, how many samples you take uh, in your theorem and also in the numerical. Okay. okay. So, so in this case, basically the the rank of this approximation will be somehow given by how many samples you have. Okay. So you uh -huh. can see that I have maybe here, like, I don't know, like maybe 15, and maybe here there's also maybe 15 or 20. So usually how many samples you are taking, so many eigenvalues on this cover here. Okay. So in this case, you have like 176 dimension. So I don't know how many I captured here. I'd say before it was much easier, because now you can really count. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and maybe there's like again seven, eight here, so maybe this was like sixteen pairs. Okay, but in your theory, uh, do you need to say the symbol uh, has to be uh, many enough uh, such that you can capture the curvature and you can guarantee some convergence? Uh, so do you have some assumptions on the? Uh, I think that the B matrix, right? So. That beam can have to be sufficiently close to your hash or so, so not not really uh, because like again the convergence is just done using this trans region stuff. So basically when you have again this BK will be low rank, right? Yeah. And then you're going to just move in some kind of direction of the gradient and so on. So again, even if my BK will be positive definite, it will still make some progress. Right, right, right. And again, basically for Sonia is the same story that what I do what, so, what I have for Sonia so is theory, so your theory only need is a BK like positive definite. No, you don't need nothing to do with this, the number of samples. No, nothing. Yeah. But but, it, but in practice definitely yeah. it, it matters I because it's because I'm curious, uh, uh, I guess your your B your your estimate of the Hessian may be uh accurate enough so that it can escape the saddle, right? So usually we are escaping saddle points much faster. Much faster than the first order method. Yes. I don't have the plot here. I got it in different presentations. Mm -hmm. But if you somehow want to make similar plot uh, to this one, give me a second where it is. Uh, I think similar to this one, Usually there'll be just like two or three epochs and you escape to the point. Uh, so again, this will be just maybe this the whole part here will be maybe just like four or five epochs or five, mm -hmm. four or five iterations in this case. Okay, I see. I see. But again, like currently the work time is not as good for deep learning because you don't really have any library which can do Hessian matrix products efficiently. Yeah. Yeah, you sure. just need to do it sequentially, and therefore you're somewhat suffering. But actually, this is like one of the reasons what we want to focus now, using some kind of adaptive adaptive techniques, which can somehow uh, choose like how many pairs to choose, right? Yeah, yeah. That that that's another question actually I want to ask. So in your in your small uh, in your network, what kind of activation function you use? Use a uh, radio? We, we use we use sig sigmoids. Sigmoid. Okay. Okay. But because also, you, there, you, there are some you, uh, hashes, uh, it doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But actually, there, there are some. There actually, there's like very. There, there are many different like sell you and I don't know what what are those different smoothed versions of of values, which works very similarly and so on. Okay. 
Okay. So again, yeah. there are some smooth versions of, of values which are differentiable. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, recently, because I, I'm teaching a course and I ask a student to implement some momentum accelerator method, and and at least I found that the accelerator method, like the momentum uh, variance reduction method, for the really activated neural network, it's not that so. It's not that stable. Yeah, it is not. It's it's not. Yeah. But again, I somehow like to use this cell. Like one of my colleagues from material science. He doesn't like it because he said that he's losing this interpretability because he wants to have something to be zero and so on. <laughs> but he was telling me that he had some some problem. I don't understand the physics at all. But there are some like piezo electric which really tells you that if you have some material, some special material, when you put some voltage, the length of this one will change. And when you some turn the voltage down, it somehow takes some time to go back. And he was on trying to train some new network, which was like 15 million parameters. It was taking him like days almost to train. <laughs> Using those algorithms, I could do it in like four or five minutes wow, on a network wow. which is only like 4,000 weights. Wow. And again, you are not really using anything on the interpretability and so on. It was still like very good uh, model and also very small. I see. <laughs> That's interesting. I was gonna say that when you want to just train like classical MNIST, you will not really beat Adam. Mm -hmm. But when yeah. you really want to do something like I need to have small model because of inference or maybe there's some noise in data, then you can really use those like fancy algorithms to make it much more stable and much more faster. Yeah, 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 sure. Any other question? Okay, we don't have questions. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Molly. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.